I'm going to talk a little about this about the report that's out that's publicly available and I, probably definitely worth your time reading. It's a it's a quick read. Um, I'm glad to see it's still around. It goes back to my days when I was with the House International Relations Committee, working for Ben Gilman, who just turned 90 years of age. If any of you remember Ben Gilman, uh, and uh, actually. Um, uh, there was a lot of resistance to putting this uh, report into play back in the back in the late 1990s, uh, and um, fortunately, we had some uh, forward-thinking forward people that actually made the, the Pentagon go ahead and do this report, which was kind of funny because a year or two later, I ended up having to do it at the Pentagon when I was uh, in the Bush administration. But it's a, I think it's an important report, and even though it's been through the tortured process of the interagency, remember this gets to passed around, and people say, oh, you can't say that, you can't say this, and um, it does come out, and it is a pretty good, I think is a pretty good primer. I don't want to get into the, any of the politics of it. Uh, you know, they have to be cautious about what they say publicly. Obviously, this is a public document. It's meant for Congress, but I, there's probably more people outside of Congress that will read it than, than inside of Congress. And of course, the Chinese will read it. And we have to be you know, careful about what we say and, and making sure there's probably some things we don't necessarily want others to know that we, that we know about them, and then putting that in, in the public. Um, it's important to protect intelligence sources and methods. Of course, we've kind of gotten away with that if you look at this report in the New York Times today on Stuxnet and Iran. But um, it, is, it is important. Anyway, this, this report is, is definitely worth looking at. Now, I, I don't think I'm going to tell this August group much about Chinese, Chinese military. I hope you're, hope you're following this issue. But let me give you some of the report takeaways that I, that I did, uh, that I've come away with. Um, China's military is becoming increasingly more capable, and it's expanding its missions. It's kind of the bottom line. In my view, it's in the process of becoming a world-class military. Um, you know, I, I think that it's, it's critically important um, that, we, that we understand that we understand that its reach and its interests are expanding beyond China's periphery, and, and which obviously includes Taiwan, which has been the central focus of the People's Liberation Army for, for a long time. Uh, it, for instance, China, most people wouldn't have thought about this, but China conducted a non-combatant evacuation operation in Libya where they moved out 30,000 people. Um, 30,000 civilians during the, during the Libyan during the Libyan crisis. I mean, that shows some some sort of global reach, not necessarily the sort of global reach that we have today, but it shows global reach. It's conducting been conducting counter piracy operations in the Gulf of Aden for a few years now, which shows its ability to maintain forces far from home. And on the public relations side, public diplomacy side, I, uh, as you will. Um, uh, they had a Chinese hospital ship which visited the Caribbean and Latin America in the last few years doing sort of uh, missions that uh, the USNS Mercy or others, others would do. The PLA, when I first started looking at the PLA in the 1990s, people used to joke that uh, China had the world's largest, that China's military, the People's Liberation Army, was the world's largest military museum. Now, at that time, it may have been, that may have been true. It's not true anymore. The PLA has a strategy, which the Pentagon has dubbed for a while now A2AD, anti-access area denial. And what's interesting about this is that this strategy, this desire, what the Chinese call the counter-intervention operations, has no geographic area that we can put our finger on. So what area is China trying to uh, deny access to or, or to uh, prevent others from operating in? I mean, I, we've said for a long time, and going back to the Bush administration, that it's, it's directed at deterring, delaying, or denying U.S. involvement in the Western Pacific or anybody else who happens to be in the Western Pacific. Um, and of course, that includes whatever Beijing decides, decides at the moment. The PLA has a budget to support this strategy uh, that has often exceeded 10 percent annually. You think about the, uh, the discussions that are going on on Capitol Hill and around Washington, around the country about the defense budget, and these folks are averaging uh, more than 10%. In fact, I think the Pentagon has said that it's been like 11%, averaging 11% over, uh, over the last 10 years. But I think it's probably more than 10% over, over the last 20. But as you know, uh, budgets only tell you so much. Right? They're just, they're really just, they're really just numbers. And it's, of course, it's very, very difficult to get an accurate uh, assessment of, uh, pay, of Beijing's uh, military military budget. They do some of their acquisitions off budget. Uh, for years, the Chinese military provided for itself. Units had, you know, gardens and businesses and things along this line. So it's been very, very difficult, although it did give you some trend. But don't, you know, we've, sometimes we focus on the budget. China probably has the world's second largest defense budget somewhere in there. But I think you, you can't just fo focus on that in that number. In the end, they're just numbers. It shows you trends, but 
what I'm really interested in are capabilities and reach. Uh, that's really important. Basically, what are those budget numbers buying and allowing the Chinese military to do? China's making important investments in weapon systems, uh, land attack cruise missiles, anti-ship ballistic cruise missiles, short and medium range conventional missiles. In fact, they believe that there's, I don't know, the numbers change, but at least over a thousand uh, deployed opposite Taiwan, uh, maybe as many as 1,200. Doesn't, that number doesn't seem to have gone up too much over the last, the last couple of years. That seems pretty steady. Anti-ship ballistic missiles. I'm not talking about cruise missiles here, ballistic missiles. This is a novel uh, technology. Uh, the DF-21, D, I think is, is there, it's being called publicly, has about a 1,500 mile range. And it's basically um, intended for large ships such as U.S. aircraft carriers. And these, if you look at what the, the first island ring, which China calls the first island ring, which is the line that extends from Japan through Taiwan down to the Philippines, uh, and it, it, it extends beyond that reach. So outside of, outside of Taiwan, out in the far western Pacific, American uh, aircraft carriers can be targeted with an anti-ship ballistic missile. I don't think we have that sort of capability, and I'm not sure what our capability is for uh, preventing or countering, countering that capability. Space and counterspace capabilities, another important, another important issue. It includes communication satellites, navigational, meteorological or weather satellites, intelligence satellites, as well as the ability to splash existing satellites using lasers, jamming, microwave, and even uh, cyber, uh, counter, space, counter space weapons. Cyber warfare, you can basically, almost can't open the, a newspaper today and read about uh, China not being somewhere on the cyber front. Today it's about Iran, but uh, it, you know, they have offensive operations that are being used for developing warfare capabilities as well as, um, as, well as espionage. Uh, the Wall Street Journal a couple of years ago reported that China and Russia had mapped our electrical grids. Um, and if you know um, anything about American electrical grids or critical infrastructures, I'm sure you do, we, we only have three electrical grids in the United States. Um, the reason they would map them is they may want to shut off the lights at some point. So imagine if there's some sort of contingency over Taiwan, over the South China Sea, you know, the Chinese might decide from a, uh, from a laptop at a, a hotspot in a coffee shop in Beijing to turn out the lights in the United States. You know, that'd be a pretty big distraction if you think about it from air traffic control perspective, all sorts of things to the national command authority, what kind of a distraction that, that would be. And as you know, I mean, they're looking at these, these matters, cyber and counter space. I mean, our slavish dependence on computers and satellites for all sorts of things, including military operations, makes that a real Achilles heel uh, for us. Naval shipbuilding. Uh, they now have China has the largest navy in Asia besides the United States. Uh, it's bigger than Japan, it's bigger than South Korea, anybody else. And they're developing multi-mission surface combatants, very capable uh, surface combatants. Submarines, including nuclear powered attack submarines as well as uh, fleet ballistic missile submarines. And of course the aircraft carrier. I remember, I remember two things. I, it, well, I remember more than two things, but I remember two things in particular about China when I think about this report is that the opposition, the opposition to putting this report into play because they were saying, well, this isn't Soviet military power. China will never be what the Soviet Union was. So, you know, why this would be antagonistic. We shouldn't look at these sort of things. And we ignored that and said it's definitely worth looking at considering the changes we've seen in China's military. It's very important that we do. The other thing I was told as a staffer was uh, by the experts, supposed experts, is that China will never have an aircraft carrier. Never. And, uh, you know, we, we saw them buy this uh, Kuznetsov class carrier many, many years ago. Um, there was talk about it becoming a casino, you know, all sorts of things. Well, now they've had one at sea since 2011. Uh, they're probably going to build more. Uh, they will not be, we will not be the only carrier navy in the, in the Pacific. Uh, and um, they're already training pilots. Nothing on carriers yet, but they have, um, they have airstrips that are mocked up to look like aircraft carriers, which we train our pilots on too. When they first start, before you send them to the boat for the first time, uh, they uh, they get some t they get some stuff uh, before they get their feet wet. They definitely do some practice landings and uh, approaches on uh, on ground. So they're looking at this, and at some point, they're probably going to send those to sea, and they're going to they're going to build a new carrier from what they've learned from these sea trials, probably from the ground up. And I, we expect. I expect that they'll have several of them. So this whole asymmetric thing that the Chinese are coming at us asymmetrically from a military standpoint is not quite true any longer. 
They're building aircraft carriers, which is one of our strengths in the Pacific. Obviously, uh, tactical aviation, uh, they're, they're, they have fourth generation fighters. Um, they have a fifth generation in the J-20 stealth fighter, which they rolled out, interestingly enough, when Bob Gates <laughs> made his visit to Beijing uh, a few years ago, the first time a Secretary of Defense had been to Beijing in several years, actually. And the same day he was in Beijing, they did a test flight of the J-20 stealth, uh, stealth fighter, which I, in my view is, was a not-so-stealth signal to, uh, to the United States about China's military capabilities. Um, I'm sure it needs a lot more development, but it's certainly they're moving in certainly moving in that direction. Also, new attack helicopters is another thing that they're providing uh, in terms of tactical aviation. Strategic nuclear modernization. They're moving from a silo-based uh, strategic nuclear force to road mobile. Uh, you've probably seen the reports about their the underground Great Wall. Has everybody seen that? Where the Chinese may have as much as 3,000 miles of underground. Um, uh, tunnels to support China's second artillery, which is basically their their missile their missile force. Um, they're also another very interesting development from a strategic standpoint is that they're they now have an at sea nuclear deterrent. Um, they have the Jin class SSBNs, fleet ballistic missile submarines, and they're equipping those with the JL2 intercontinental ballistic missile, sea launch ballistic missile, which there's. Publicly, it's not quite clear whether that's operational, whether that's operational or not, but that's definitely a direction they're looking at. They're, a lot of these submarines are being put on Hainan Island uh, at a new base, a new base called Yalong, and they supposedly can actually, uh, uh, because of the tunnels that have been bored in the side of the island, the submarines can leave port without uh, being detected visually. Hopefully, there'll be other ways to detect them, but uh, that's a, uh, you know, obviously they're very serious about their, their new nuclear deterrent. Uh, training, they're spending a lot of money on training. Joint operations, they watch what we do, they watch what the finest militaries in the world do, uh, and um, they're, getting, they're getting better at it. Advances in C4ISR, which is critical to any modern military, you gotta have these, these shiny, flashy, new, capable weapon systems to be able to talk to, talk to one another. Uh, so they're, they're, that's going on. So I, in, in general, I think uh, it's pretty impressive, for, especially for anybody who's been watching the PLA for you know 15 years or so now. Uh, if you just started watching them, you might not be surprised, but um, going back 15 or so years, this has been some significant, significant changes. And a lot of the, the folks who are predicting the course of the PLA, uh, in my view, have turned out to be, out to be wrong. Uh, the result is that China is now, I think, a significant military power in the Pacific. And that's uh, important for us to note. The military balance of power across the Taiwan Strait is also continues to tilt towards Beijing. That's not really a new thing, but it's not getting any, I don't think it's getting any, getting any better. Um, with its increased capability, my view is that Beijing is increasingly able to back up its perceived national interests with military might. Uh, this is a trend I worry most about. For instance, how will the Beijing employ the PLA to assert its interests in the region, such as the South China Sea? Uh, we've seen some of this already, but um, it's something we need to be thinking about. So the big question is, is okay, they have this military capability. What's, what's China's real strategic intent? Um, my, my simple mathematics for threat is capabilities plus intent. And we can certainly see capabilities being developed just through this unclassified report, especially over the years. But the intent is really difficult to discern and can change quite quickly. You know, what are China's strategic intentions? This is a big question. It's particularly important for us to be conscious of because we're gonna have a major change in Chinese leadership early next year. A new generation of, uh, of leaders are going to come in and we really wanna know what they're, what they're thinking about where China, they might, they might take, take China. Another question that kind of bothers me is that I sense that we're not, we don't necessarily fully understand China's uh, strategic nuclear modernization and policies. They don't talk about it. They don't want to talk about it. We've tried to engage them for a long time uh, on, this, on this issue, and they just really don't want to engage in a substantive sort of way. Does new first use policy still apply? I think the Pentagon, this Pentagon, believes that it, that it still does. Um, have they moved beyond minimum deterrence? Is counterforce capability in the mix somewhere down the road? Uh, are we looking at potential rush to parity with the United States as we conclude new arms control agreements like the new Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty? How many warheads does China actually have? I mean, we seemed like we were able to get a pretty good count of China's uh, silo-based force, but now we've got 3,000 miles of underground tunnels, road mobile missiles, 
solid fueled, MERVs. Um, I mean, this is something for us to really, really consider. And when during this, the start debate, I guess that's a year and a half ago now, right? My goodness. Uh, this is one of the things I tried to call out. I said, I would think looking at what China's doing. We have, you know, what are they, where are they going with their nuclear force? What do we know about their nuclear force? When they have, if they're MIRVed, how many warheads does it mean they have? Uh, so these are, these are big questions. And of course, I'll, I'll just close here quickly, was, is uh, another major concern is our defense budget. Because we're not operating, our military, and the Chinese military aren't operating in a vacuum, they're operating in the Pacific. And operate, operating separately from one another. Are we going to be prepared militarily to deal with China if we have to? To protect and protect and advance our interests. And I think that's something we really ought to we really ought to think about. So with that, with that, I'd say it's worthwhile if you're not following China issues. It's a quick, quick read, something that I think is a pretty good, pretty good primer among administrations. And um, there's probably a lot of things we don't know that aren't being said publicly, but this gives us a little bit peek behind the curtain of uh, of the Chinese military. Thank you. Yeah. Terrific. Thank you. We have time for several questions. Um, I know Ben had one. He gets uh, uh, the moderator's prerogative. Just very quickly, Pete. Um, some folks on the other side of the debate on the law of the sea treaty yeah. are arguing that, you know, given what China is up to in the South China Sea, and given that they are a party to that treaty, that we should sign up for that treaty as well in order to better address their behavior, perhaps modify it using the means afforded in the treaty, I guess. What are your thoughts on that? I, I wrote about this a week or so ago in the New York Post where I've been a columnist for, for a while, and I, I, don't, I don't get it. I don't buy it. Um, I don't know, if you're not following China issues, you may not, may not be aware, but China basically claims the entirety of the South China Sea as sovereign territory. They have this nine-dashed line. Uh, in fact, you know, it's, it's not only the Chinese government, but even go to, uh, if you fly a Chinese airline, uh, and you go to the in-flight magazine, you know how American airlines have the maps in the back, this is where we fly. Well, they show, they show this nine-dash line. I mean, this is pervasive. China, based on some legal claims, based on some historical claims, uh, says the South China Sea is theirs. They also don't abide by the Law of the Sea Treaty right now. They, you know, they, they consider if you look at the, I'm not a, a lawyer, but my understanding of the Law of the Sea Treaty, you should check out Steve Grove's writing on this. He's done a great job at Heritage on this issue. Um, is that, you know, the China, you have your 12 mile territorial waters, and you got your 200 mile exclusive economic zone. Well, the Chinese consider that the exclusive economic zone is the same as the 12 nautical mile territorial seas. So they're already violating. We've had, we've had uh, you know, dust ups with them, with uh, our sh ships in the South China Sea over this issue. Um, and with and with others, so this is a problem. They're already violating the, the uh, law of the sea treaty. So I'm not sure how us getting in there is going to change China's mind. The other issue is what I just talked about. The Chinese are increasingly capable of pushing back on these issues. Right now, they're kind of using, you know, government sort of ships and you know fishery patrol sort of uh, coast guard sort of types to do this sort of stuff. But at some point, there it's going to be the Chinese, going to be the Chinese Navy, and we have seen the Chinese Navy assert Beijing's uh, interests. In fact, I think there's an article out in one of the papers today. I haven't seen it. Came in my email about Chinese increasing assertiveness in the South China Sea. So I don't, I don't quite, I don't think that us, I don't think that us putting our uh, John Hancock on a, on a piece of paper is going to make the folks in Zhongnanghai and Beijing go have an epiphany and say, geez, what were we thinking? So I just, I just don't see it. I mean, I, I, a lot of the argumentation, I know you, you guys have talked about law of the sea a lot, and there's a lot of experts here to talk about it. The same thing with Iran. I mean, Iran is not even a member of the law of the sea treaty. But so I, I don't think it's going to change China. China has their interest in it. At one point, they backed off of this, which was interesting, but at one point they called the South China Sea uh, a core interest, which is a code word for something we're willing to fight over. In the same category are places like Taiwan, Tibet, Xinjiang. So the Chinese, they, they backed off of it pretty quickly. This happened a few years ago in, uh, down at an ASEAN conference. Uh, and and um, so this is something that's, that's obviously very important to them, but I don't see it changing Beijing's mind at all about uh, what they think is uh, their interpretation of the Law of the Sea Treaty. Other questions? Claire? Uh, thanks, Peter. That's, it's, it's been great. Um, proliferation, mm -hmm. uh, in, in particular uh, in the Middle East, long uh, 
China has been looked at as a proliferator to Iran's yeah. WMD programs, uh, uh, in particular nuclear programs. Um, are they now perhaps hedging their bets a little? It, it, I have seen a report that, that China is now, um, I guess, contracting to help build a, um, an oil refinery for Saudi Arabia, or is it a, a nuclear? Uh, a nuclear reactor, I think, is, is what it is. Are they, are they sort of hedging their bets on who's going to, you know, uh, come out on top here? In, a, in the Middle East? In the Middle East, in the Persian Gulf in particular? Well, I think, I think the Chinese are, are pretty pragmatic about things. They're always willing to let others do the heavy lifting. If you look what they do at the, uh, you know, they, they sit on the fence often and let others do it. I mean, look at Syria. I mean, for instance, they're not, the, they're, they're unwilling to take a stand at the uh, UN Security Council. Like the, everybody talks about the Russians, but the Chinese are a little better. They're not supporting any sort of serious sanctions or any sort of military intervention in, in Syria. And the Chinese are happy just like the Iranian nuclear program. The Chinese are happy for the United States to, you know, do the heavy lifting. On, on this sort of on this sort of stuff, they're very very cautious. Uh, they try not to make waves, and then uh, they will. Uh, I think they will try to um, um, capitalize on whichever whichever way it goes. It's kind of like watching a, you know, fight in the, in the school in the, in the playground. You know, it's like uh, I'm going to see who wins this, and then I'm going to decide to be friendly with that with the winner. And I think the Chinese. This is the Chinese are very much a practical uh, sort of a way. They they talk about not interfering in the internal matters of others because they don't want anybody to inter interfere in theirs. But I think it also serves them. Of course, they kind of, they violate that principle every once in a while. But um, you know, I think this is uh, what they're doing in terms of in terms of the Middle East. They're obviously worried about energy security in the Middle East. Um, they realize that there may be some new big powers in that in that part of the world. I mean, many people believe that if Iran goes nuclear, so will Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, another thing I'm worried about is as China's developed these uh, military capabilities, um, who are they going to sell the conventional weapons to? That's another thing. I mean, you know, if you're developing fourth generation fighters, uh, and you, I haven't, I haven't witnessed this myself, but I just saw a picture the other day. I don't know where it was. We're talking. It was a Chinese arms salesman at one of the world's, uh, you know, large arms shows. Uh, they'll be selling things, and they may not be selling to people who are particularly friendly to us, I mean, other than the North Koreans. So conventional arms is another, is, another, is another matter besides weapons of mass destruction. Obviously, weapons of mass destruction are critically important. Well, the Chinese sold the C-802, as you know, Claire, to the Iranians who turned it around and seemed to have given it to Hezbollah, which, you know, put a big hole in an Israeli destroyer during that war in 2006. So... I don't know. I mean, yeah, they, they're, they're Venezuelans, it seems, are buying most of their stuff from Russia, but I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of Chinese stuff there, but that's always a possibility, and that's, you know, that's a concern. Who will the Chinese sell those weapons to, the conventional weapons that can make a, or obviously ballistic missiles and any sort of weapon of mass destruction? I think we have time. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, yeah, in the back, on the corner, and then the gentleman straight back. Thanks. There have been some reports about economic growth in China slowing significantly yeah. um, and r problems with corruption. And I was just wondering how that might affect military spending, if it will at all. I think it has already, actually. But because uh, China a few years ago, I can't tell you exactly what year ago, but I mean, they, they've announced, uh, they announced their increases in military spending, usually when the National, National People's Congress meets. But we've had years where they've had 17, 18 percent increases. So now we're talking, I think this last year was like 11%. So they're feeling it. But you have to remember that they, this is a, a, a statist economy uh, where uh, going all the way back to Deng Xiaoping talked about how the civilians should support the military and vice versa. So dual use technologies that support, that, that, can, be impl that can be put into military technology uh, whether they buy it legally or they steal it via cyber espionage, which is a huge problem for the United States, it goes to support their industries. And obviously, like I said, don't focus so much on budget. It's obviously cheaper to build something in China than it is to build in some other places in the world. So that you have to be careful about that. But they've had budget increases of up to 17 or so percent. So, and they've had to slow military spending, but I, I think we'd all be pretty happy if we could you know, pick a number between eight and ten in terms of defense budget growth, right? So uh, they're they're doing pretty they're doing pretty well that way. And if you think about it, over you know twenty years, I mean, once again, China had a very uh, pretty decrepit military twenty years ago, but the the changes uh, are are dramatic uh, that we've uh, you know that that we've seen with them. But yes, it is it certainly is going to affect them to a certain degree uh, from at least as far as as far as I know, they're public figures. We have time for one last uh, question, and then we'll open it up to the good of the order. Uh, one last short question and short answer. 
Thanks. Now, throughout your presentation, you discussed the outward thrust of Chinese military activity, whether missile development or uh, naval capabilities being pretty much south and east of there, whereas the country with which they have the longest common border, obviously, is the Russian Federation, from whom they have, as you mentioned, acquired actually some of their weaponry. Yeah. The buildup of China, does that pose any potential threat down the road to the Russian Federation, or do they, are the relations so strong now that really the Chinese th threat that grows is really posed very much outward in the other direction now? I mean, you'd, you'd have to ask the Russians, obviously. Uh, but as an outside observer, uh, I think the Russians, um, I think the Russians have concerns about China. Uh, obviously, there's history there. There's a long border. Um, they've had falling political fallings outs so over the year. They've had some military, you know, battles and things along things along that line. The, my understanding is that the Russian uh, military uh, equipment transfers has has dropped significantly because the Chinese were reverse engineering it, and some of their newer fighters are based on like the Su-27 Sukhoi um, you know, fighter, and the Chinese basically was had a, a production license, and then by the time they finished the production license and built the Su-27s, they'd already built a fighter that was as good or better than the Su-27. So I think there's, I think there's concerns, but I think they also, there's, you know, uh, marriages of convenience and marriages of necessity between the two sides as they try to balance the United States, and I think that's what's really, what's really going on there. I wouldn't say relations are warm between them, but I think they're very pragmatic. So it's hard, it's hard to say, uh, but the Russians have concerns about uh, demographic issues in the Far East. There's a lot of Chinese immigration into, uh, into the Ch Russian Far East, and uh, like I said, there is some, there is some history there. So it's, it's a, so I think it's a tenuous relationship at the time that could go in any number of directions. In fact, they just had their first ever naval exercises. The Russians are trying to assert themselves in the Far East, and the Chinese obviously are developing a significant navy. If you go back to the Cold War, the, the, the largest Russian fleet was in the Pacific at Vladivostok. And um, they just had their first ever naval exercises together. Didn't get any, any fanfare, but it shows you, I think, um, the pragma pragmatisms of, uh, of the relationship.